Welcome to Cat and Jess Talk the Best, where we're going to be talking about IMDb's top 250 movies from April 12th, 2018. My name is Cat, And I'm Jess. And today we are talking about number 189, Hotel Rwanda, which is a biography drama history film from 2004. This has an 8.1 on 317,534 votes. So we are going to reveal the mystery line from Stand By Me today. So the line was, Well, I've wrestled with reality for 35 years, Doctor, and I'm happy to state I finally won out over it. That is from Harvey. It's like, yeah, that's an older film. Yeah. I have all the colors back. We have purple, dark blue, green, red, orange, light blue. Orange. All right. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. (laughs) That's a great one. Oh, thank you for that. I picked all horror movie ones for this (laughs) time. I appreciate that one. That's one of my favorites. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. So make sure you take a guess at that one, because we will be revealing it in our Platoon episode. So the spoiler-free synopsis, Paul Rusepagina, a Hutu, manages the Hotel de Mikolin and lives a happy life with his Tutsi wife and their three children. But when the Hutu army forces initiate a campaign of ethnic cleansing against the Tutsi minority, Paul is compelled to allow refugees to take shelter in his hotel. As the UN pulls out, Paul must struggle alone to protect the Tutsi refugees in the face of the escalating violence, later known as the Rwandan Genocide. All right, so this is directed by... Uh, Terry George, he has also directed films like Some Mother's Son, The Promise, and Reservation Road. And this stars Don Cheadle, Sophie Okonado, and Joaquin Phoenix. And we have had Don Cheadle before in our superhero event in Infinity War. Yep. We have... So... He's the only one. There's quite a few big names in this movie, but he's um, the only one we've had so far. So the ratings on IMDb, 34.8% of users rated this at an 8. Metacritic has a 79. Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 91 on 193 critical reviews. Two of the fresh, David Anson. Cheadle, in his richest role since Devil in the Blue Dress, burrows deep inside this complex man who discovers in himself a strength he never knew he possessed as he faces the disillusion of all the civilized notions he believes in. It's a really long way to say he did a really good performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, he did do a great job in this. He did. That's just like a really, really long way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Paul Ardent, Ardent, I don't know. The emotion comes from Don Cheadle's thrilling portrait of ordinary heroism, a performance that's matched only by the magnificent Sophie Oconito as his wife, Tatiana. Yeah. Yeah. So, the two rotten, Scott Tobias... So, showing traces of the well-meaning paternalism that dogs many Western films about Africa, Hotel Rwanda doesn't go far enough in indicating Europeans and Americans for protecting their own while failing to intervene in time to stop the mass killings. (laughs) Europeans and Americans didn't do anything. That's the thing. Yeah, they didn't do anything. Nobody did anything. No, that that sounds like... uh... A lot of things. I'll say that. Yeah. They just let them kill each other. It's like, oh, it's not gonna bother me none. Jay and Tani? 
potentially fantastic material. Unfortunately, Terry George's attempt is too mirrored in movie of the week sensibilities to do any justice to its subject matter. I think this is what I was trying to tell you. <laughs> okay. So the consensus, a sobering and heartfelt tale about massacre that took place in Rwanda while most of the world looked away. Yeah. Yeah. That That's a good consensus. I agree with that. So the money, the budget was 17.5 million. Opening weekend, the limited release, it made $100,091. It's wide release, it made $2,316,416. Domestically, it made $23,530,892. Internationally, it made $10,351,351. For a worldwide total of thirty-three million eight hundred eighty-two thousand two hundred forty-three dollars, the all-time domestic rank is three thousand one hundred seventy-one. Huh. You made quite a bit of money. Yeah. Not near as much as movies now, but <laughs> <laughs> this is also a fifteen-year-old movie. That's true. So the awards, it was nominated for three Oscars, but did not win any. And it had 16 other award or other wins and 45 other nominations. So I'm just going to find, it got a lot of um, best feature films, um, best director, stuff like that. Um, best actress, Sophie Okonedo. Iowa Film Critics Awards Best Movie Yet to Open in Iowa. <laughs> That's what I was looking at. I'm like, what? Yeah, I know. So okay. then how do you know it? what it... Uh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. The Political Film Society PFS Award for Human Rights. And then the Satellite Awards Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama Don Cheadle. Best Motion Picture Drama, Best Original Song for Million Voices, the one that the kids sing, which I absolutely love that, so it just gets you. <laughs> oh, yeah. But that's all. I'm not going to read all the awards because it's it most of the same stuff, so. That's true. Initial thoughts. Do you want me to go first? Go ahead. Okay, so. I was trying to figure out a way how to explain this and how I felt about this. So, I got it related to a musical, okay? This is how it's going to help me tell how to describe this. Okay, so, um, about two years ago, I saw, I was, like, super excited to see Jesus Christ Superstar. I was like, yes, I cannot wait. This looks great. I know the songs, you know, I know about it. And I went... I mean, there was some good singing. There's some good acting. It just felt overall the direction of it was not good. And that's kind of how I feel with this movie. I mean, yeah, great actors, some great acting. The story is very heartfelt, very hard to watch at some points. It's just I felt like it fell flat with the directing. That's what I was trying to get at. It's the direction. And I've had that same problem with this director, too, because I've actually seen his movie, uh, The Promise, and that's how I felt, too. I was like, okay, this sounds promising, you know, because The Promise is also similar to this movie because it's also about a genocide. So I was like, okay, I went into it knowing about that. And then again, I just felt like he fell flat trying to tell the story, okay? So, nothing against the story, nothing against the actors, it's a direction for me. But, overall, not a bad movie. Uh, the first time I watched this, I was 15, I think. Because I was a freshman in high school. So, I think I was 15. Um, so, we watched it, I think it was like geography class or something like that. 
but we were learning about something. I have no idea what we were learning about, but my teacher's like, hey, we're going to watch this movie. And I was like, awesome, we get to watch a movie. <laughs> I didn't really care what movie <laughs> we were watching. <laughs> I was just like, oh, we don't have to do anything. But this hit me pretty hard when I was in high school because, I mean, I knew about the Holocaust and stuff, but I figured that was, like, the worst thing in history. Like, nothing else could really ever be that bad and no this wasn't to the numbers of that but it's still like the same situation it's still genocide and I was like why do people hate each other so much like it's just like I have a problem with people hating other people just for the way they like who they are and the way they look and stuff I really really have a problem with that like I get so mad at racism and this is basically racism, just one, or minority, I guess it is, one minority against the majority in Rwanda. And it just, like, hit me real hard that this could even be a thing. Like, at 15, you see this, and you're just like, oh my god, why am I seeing all this killing? And yeah, no, it's not real in the movie, but this stuff really did happen, and I was just like, holy crap. And it is kind of slow to start because he's, they've got to kind of build to everything that happens. But once it gets going, like, it just constantly is hitting you with killing throughout the rest of the movie. And it's brutal. And if you have a hard time watching people die, then you should not watch this movie at all. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I do agree with you, especially about how that question, I kept thinking that in my head too, and I was watching, like, why do people hate each other so much? Yeah. That's what I kept thinking, too. That was, like, my major thing when I was 15 years old. I was like, why is why did this happen? Cause this happened in 1994. Mm -hmm. And then this movie came out 10 years afterwards. And I feel like a lot of people didn't even know about it, especially in America. Because I had never <laughs> yeah. even heard about it until I watched this movie. So it's just ridiculous. It's really dumb. But. Boy, the That was your warning. If you haven't watched the film yet, then stop listening and come back after you've watched it. So, we've kind of start off with this guy. He's, like, talking on the radio or something, I guess, about the Tutsi, which are... I don't know what the real... I don't know what the, like, the word is for it. But they're in Rwanda. There's the Hutu and the Tutsi. And... They classify them differently, and they they explain in the movie later on, like, what the difference is of them. Yeah, and but, that the bullshit thing is, there's really no difference. Yeah, there's really not much of a difference. It's just really how you're born. Which Pretty is much. stupid. Exactly. But there's this guy going off about the Tutsi and how there's rebels all over the place, and they're trying to convince the president that everything's fine and it's not, and stuff like that. And... It's in K Kigali. Yeah. In Kigali. 1994. We see kind of just at the beginning, it's uh, like just like a market area where people are um, just going about their business, going about their day because nothing has really happened yet. Like there's, there's um, people from both sides, the Hutu and the Tutsi, that are activists, I guess, is what you could call them right now. <laughs> right now, yes. <laughs> yeah, right now. Um, but at the moment, nothing... Portrayed in the movie, at least, nothing bad has happened quite yet. We just see everybody kind of going about their lives. And we see the main guy, Paul, 
which is Don Cheadle's character. He's going to, I guess, kind of like a business meeting because he's a manager of a hotel. The yes. hotel, Mikolin. And he's got his dude driving him to where he's going because he has to go pick up stuff for his hotel, like pick up supplies and stuff. And they're having like this whole entire conversation about cigars. And he's like telling them, because the driver, he's like, I don't understand why you have to give them cigars. And he's like, because I can't, like, these are $10,000 cigars. If I give somebody $10,000, okay, whatever. But if we sit and have, or 10,000 francs, so it's a different, yeah, it's a frank. different money there. Um, but if I give them a cigar and sit down and talk to them and get to know them, that builds a better relationship rather than giving someone money. And I'm like, well, you're not wrong. No, that's completely but, not wrong. I would have thought the same thing, too. But, I mean, some people would just rather have the money. I mean, I would rather take the money, but I don't smoke, so. Yeah, same. That was just, like, my thing. I'm like, I don't smoke, so I'd rather just have $10,000. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Or 10,000 francs. I don't know how, I don't know what the exchange rate is at that point, or even I know, now. Because a franc is from France. Yep. I don't know anything about money other than spending it. <laughs> yeah yeah i know what that is <laughs> but so they go and they get um they're going to get supplies and they like need food and beer and stuff to f and whiskey like stuff to basically like run the hotel you know and they're the one guy he's like running the forklift and he's got a case on the forklift but the head guy's like yelling at him, hey, that's not beer, put that back. And so he like tries to back up, but he moves too fast. So the case falls and breaks open, and it's just a ton of machetes. Yeah. Which is kind of important to remember. Well, and it's also kind of like the first moment in the movie, especially the younger you are when you see this. Like me, 15 years old, I'm like, why do you need machetes? Like, what are you, what's about to happen? Because going into it, I had no idea what it was about because I'd never heard anything about it and then you see those machetes and I'm like oh no this is gonna be bad yeah he's like I got him for a bargain yeah he's like 10 cents each from China like that's not a good thing to brag about I mean <laughs> no definitely not <laughs> I mean yeah you got a great deal but you bought a bunch of machetes yeah so um they're driving back, and there's, like, this parade of... We don't know it at the time till the driver says something. Uh, I don't remember his name, but... Dubé. Okay, so till Dubé says something, we don't know it at the time, but these are, um, I guess, Hutu protesters? Yes. They, they're walking around, they've got signs and stuff, they're flashing their colors. Um, so it kind of looks like a parade, but like a protest parade. So then the then Dubé is super worried because he's Tutsi and he knows that the Hutu does not like any Tutsis. Like, they just think they're vile and disgusting. Which like I think is Yeah. Which I think is stupid. But I'm just going to go past that. <laughs> <laughs> but so a few of them come up to the window and they're, like, questioning Dubé and... Paul has a shirt that the guy he got the supplies from gave him because Paul is Hutu. And he's like flashing the shirt at them, like saying, no, we're on your side. We're good. Let us, let us buy. And I feel like at that moment, that's the only thing that saves Dubé. Because if it was just him, they probably would have pulled him out of that van and killed him. Probably. So, um... They're bringing the supplies into the hotel and stuff, and there's a box that's leaking everywhere. And it's like, <laughs> it's lobster tails, I guess? It's lobster, yeah. And, oh, it's just the, like the full lobster? Yeah. Well, so they're trying to figure out what to do with it, and then they kind of, uh, they're, they come up with a plan. And then Paul is having a meeting with the military leader, I guess? Um... I don't remember which one it was because there's two of them he kind of talks to. There's the UN guy that which he talks is the to, Colonel, Colonel and, Oliver, and the general. And then the general is the general of the Hutu army in Rwanda. Yeah. But I think at this point he's talking to the general. 
I don't remember. But he's talking to somebody. Uh, there's the radio. Throughout this entire movie, they're always listening to the radio. And it's they're always listening to, like, the Hutu propaganda about how bad the Tutsis are. Yeah. And it's always the same guy. Like, the big radio personality just trying to convince everybody. It and, just hate speech. It's all it yeah. is. And then there's quite a few times throughout the movie that they listen to this. And Paul is always the one to change it. Because he's like, you don't need to hear that. They're just talking bad. You don't need to hear it. So then he heads home and we see his family and everything. And he's kind of having like a normal day. And they're eating dinner or like after dinner or something. And his kid comes and tells him that there's soldiers coming down the street. And they look, they watch outside through the gate and they see that they're taking this man from his house and the man's like resisting so the soldiers attack him like start beating him yeah and then one of them looks over and sees them and so they kind of hide and he's talking with his wife yeah he's talking about it he's talking about like getting help for the people because they can tell it's starting to get bad like things are getting too bad to be staying in the area and she's like we need to get some help and he's like who's who's gonna help us he's like i'm trying to build up some allies you know at working at the hotel yeah he's, he's trying he's doing what he can but it's also he's also already knows he's in that position of who's who's gonna help us like we've got the un here already who else is gonna help um but then we see the reporters arrive at the hotel, and this is where we get a very young Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. It's like 15 years difference from, you know, this year and Joker. So. Yeah, he was super young in this movie. I was like, holy, holy crap. And literally the only reason I recognized him is because of his eyes and his beard, because he has a very thick beard right now. So I've seen him in interviews and stuff recently and i'm like oh but yeah it was his eyes and his beard that's literally the only reason i recognized him because he looks so young <laughs> i was like well thing i've seen him in like movies before this so because he was in gladiator yeah so Which that I mean? was like 2000 yeah i just looked 2000 <laughs> so i'm like i recognized him right away but i'm better at recon act recognizing actors so they're better at pairing them with their names i'm good at recognizing them and putting them <laughs> with a movie <laughs> You're like, I know that dude. I know that person from this movie or this TV show. <laughs> there you go. It, it um, works for you, cat. It works. It does. Because then I look up their name and I'm like, oh, yeah, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> or I look them up on IMDb and I'm like, oh, yeah, I was right. But so the ho the reporters get there and um, they are supposed to kind of report on the story of, like, what's going on in the country and stuff. And so they are staying at the hotel. And Joaquin's character's name is Jack, I believe. Yeah, it's and Jack. He's talking to this guy who's telling him the difference between the Hutu and the Tutsis. Which, I mean, there's not really much of a difference. Yeah, he literally, like, Jack looks over, he sees two girls, and he asks them, okay, well, what are you? And they're like, she's like, oh, I'm a Hutu. And Ellen's like, are you also a Hutu? He's like, no, I'm a Tutsi. I'm like, they could be twins. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you. I feel like a lot of it throughout, like, pictures and stuff from not only this movie, but also in pictures, the only thing is Tutsi have a little bit lighter skin than the Hutus. But even yeah. then, there's some of them that it doesn't, like... There's some Hutus that have lighter skin and some Tutsis that have darker skin. So it's really no difference at all. Just rather w how they're like what their parents were when they were born. So I feel like there might have been a difference a while ago, like a long, long time ago. Like there were two different tribes in different areas of the country of Rwanda. And then they just started in intermingling kind of like Native Americans here. There are different names for them, and they have different, like, cultures and stuff. But if you don't know them, it can be hard for you to tell them apart. True. That's the only thing I can really think. I think that's the only thing you can relate it to, really. Well, yeah. 
I mean, we can think of other cultures, too. But Yeah, it's like that in every culture. Like, it's if you don't know, then it's hard to tell it apart. It's, it's true. Like, we're not in that country, so we don't know. We don't know how to tell it apart. That's, a, that's basically what Jack is trying to portray there. He's just trying to portray that Come, coming from, like, an outside perspective, you can't tell the difference, really. I was like, I want to point that out later when we get to it. There's something okay. in there that I want to talk about. Okay. Later in the movie. That I want to point out. Um, but so there's a news report about kind of what's going on and stuff. And then we see Paul's brother-in-law visits him, and he's got info about... Um how something is about to happen and he knows that something is about to happen there's like a key phrase that's going to be spoken over the radio something about trees yeah i wrote it down oh we must cut the tall trees that's the key phrase i was like it's something to do with trees i remember that and that is the signal for the hutus to start killing like just mass slaughter And so he's, like, trying to tell Paul they all need to get out of there so that they're safe. But he's like, nothing's going to happen. The president's about to sign this peace treaty. We're going to be fine. He's just trying to... He's kind of in that negligent mindset of nothing's going to happen. It's going to be okay. Just ignore it and it'll go away. (laughs) Kind of like little blinders going on. Yeah. Because... The state of the country, you you know bad things are going on, but you just don't want it to get any worse, so you're just trying to ignore it to make it go away, but that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, that sounds about right. It really doesn't work. It doesn't. And it's that it happens in every country, including America. And it's not good, no matter what. But so, the power is flickering. At the hotel. Like, kind of flickers on and off a couple times. At the hotel, yeah, there's power cuts and everything, and then chaos starts happening. Literally. Yeah. Like, he hears screaming, and there's fires going on, people are screaming, there's all kinds of, like, what, if I'm really, like, I think I wrote down soldiers, like, in the road. Yeah, there's military all over the place, um, there's firemen all over the place. They say, I think it was firemen. I just, it was like chaos. Yeah. That's what it was to me. It's like when shit hits the fan, that's what happens. Yeah. But so I think he he heads home because all this crazy stuff is happening. So he wants to go check on his family. And the house is dark when he gets there. So he's kind of worried about it, you know. He thinks that the soldiers have come and taken his family because he's Hutu, but his wife is Tutsi. So I don't know how that works for his kids, but it's not good no matter what because um, the Hutu don't like it when the Hutu people intermingle with the Tutsi people. So just that whole situation, he's really worried about it. He's like running around looking for his kids and his wife. Um... And he opens a door, and there's a ton of people hiding in his house. Yep, they're hiding in his house, and they're, like, freaked out because they thought they heard that the president was killed. Yeah. They're saying that the, um, that they were informed that the Tutsi rebels killed the president right after he signed the, um, peace treaty. So basically now that peace treaty is out the window. Yeah. Um, but they're, like, trying to call everybody, and the phones aren't working. Um, and then this is the part where, yes. uh, they can't find his son, his son Roger. Um, so I guess he went next door or something. I don't know why it doesn't say, but he went next door. So, of course, Paul and Tatiana go looking for him, and they, they're, like, looking all over, they're freaking out, and then they find him in the bushes, And he's covered in blood, so they think he's hurt. They think he's been cut by um, something or shot or something bad happened. And so they bring him back in and they're like wiping all the blood off and trying to find the cut or the wound or whatever. 
and they can't find it, and then they realize that that blood is not his. And this is another moment, it's just like, it's crazy scary if you're a kid, seeing another child just covered in blood, and it's not even their blood. And this is like, another moment that you get that hint that something really, really bad is about to happen. Uh, next day? Uh, well, I think it's the same night. Actually, it might be the next day. But there's the radio report. Um, the Hutu, I guess, propaganda radio. And this is where we get the line, we must cut the tall trees. And that's the signal word. And you can see it on Paul's face. He's like, oh, this is really about to happen. Like, he just said that all these people are about to die. Yeah. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's the next day. Um, but so there's soldiers at the house, um, and they're pulling everyone out of Paul's house. Like, literally everybody that was in there is getting pulled out. And he had, like, everyone from the street, like, all of his neighbors in the house with him. And so the neighbor, the, the Paul is like, can I please take my family? I can't leave them here. We need to go. Because Paul is the only one at that point that has shown his papers to the um, military. And these are the Hutu soldiers. So they're like, okay, you can come. He's like, can I bring my family? And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever, come on. Well, actually, no, they resist at first. They're like, we can't take this many people. And, then, and he's like, well, I have my own van. Can we just take them in my own van? And they're like, yeah, fine. They are being escorted to another hotel because Paul has to get the soldiers some supplies and stuff. And so there's like fear and panic everywhere there's people running all over the place um we see some fires there's people dead on their lawns yeah um we hear about a bunch of raids and hostages we see some raids and we see people just like standing there with swords and guns in their hands just threatening people sitting on the ground um but so they get to the hotel and paul goes in and he has to get something from the safe And he takes some money while the soldiers aren't looking. He takes some of the money from the safe and then takes out everything else that they had wanted. And then they go back outside and we see that the van is empty. And uh, he the soldiers have taken out everyone, like all the people that were in the vans, taken them all out and have them all lined up, their hands on the back of their heads, like, Basically, begging for their lives on the ground because the soldiers figured out that they are Tutsi. And so they're ready to kill them. Um, But Paul shows that he has the keys and stuff and he's like, I can pay you. Like, what do you want so that you don't kill these people? Like, don't kill them. Trying to save them and all that. And the military guy is mad and everything. He, like, tries to get Paul to shoot them. He's like, I don't use guns. Um, I'm like, that's kind of a good excuse, but I feel like that wouldn't work. (laughs) No. I feel like it really would not work. And he's like, I can get the money for everybody. Yeah, he promises 100,000 francs. Um, But so the soldier lets them go after he gets the money. Then we're back at the Hotel Mikulin because we were at some other hotel that he used to work at but doesn't work at anymore or something like that or I don't know something weird (laughs) I don't really know how that situation works because he still knows the safe code and stuff so I think he's kind of working at both of them or maybe they're like sister hotels or something I don't know that part was a little bit confusing yeah I agree with you I was like okay why you got two different places yeah but so they go back to the uh, Mikulin, and there's people trying to check out of that hotel because, of course, the massacres have started already, and they're, like, trying to get out of there. Um, and then Gregoire, who is one of the workers of the hotel, has decided to move into the presidential suite and just take it upon himself to do whatever the 
whatever he wants. Yeah, I didn't write his name down, just put asshole. Yeah, his name is Gregoire. Yeah, I didn't give a shit. I was like, this dude's an <laughs> asshole. I'm like him. I know. But so, um, he's like threatening Paul, telling him that he's gonna tell the military that he's harboring uh, Tootsies. And Paul just like lets him go about his day to keep him from calling anyone. They get the um, little kids from the orphanage. Yep. Yeah. Um, the little kids have come. This I don't remember the woman's name, but she's part of the Red Cross and she's there. Um, she was already there in the country, and she happened to be at the orphanage. I think her name's Pat. I think so. That sounds familiar. But so she's brought all these kids to Paul because they're orphans and they have nowhere to go. So you can't leave them at the orphanage. Especially if it's out place, like, somewhere that is not safe at all. But she's like, I'm going to bring you these, and then I have to go get some more of them. Because there's ten more kids that I have to get. But so Paul um, has one of his staff take care of the kids. And at first she's like, what am I supposed to do? There's so many of them. But then he le he's like, just, like, feed them bathe them stuff like that like just take care of them like they need someone and so he leaves and then i thought this was like a really kind of like a promising human moment like most of the time humans are especially in this movie terrible but this was like a promising human moment where she's just like she does it she just puts a smile on her face and makes it look like she's not worried about it just because the kids already look super scared so I thought that was cool. Boy, do I know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, as it's someone who works with children, yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes you just have to put a smile on your face. Like, you have no choice. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I know. <laughs> I really know how to do that. Um, at some point in this, Paul's wife has asked Paul to figure out where her brother is because they can't find him like the phones aren't working and stuff and they so they haven't been able to find him um and they also asked pat before she left to go check on their brother because they haven't heard from him so she's gonna check on him and stuff so um paul is talking to the un guy colonel oliver i think yeah, yeah colonel oliver talking to him and he's saying that the UN's not going to step in. They're just there to keep peace, not make peace. I thought that was, like, a really important distinction. It's like they're not they're, soldiers. Yeah, they're not there to fight. They're there to protect people. Like, they're only there to keep the people in the hotel and some of the people out in the country. Because the hotel is for, it's, like, a really well-known hotel, so it's, a lot of European visitors, European and American visitors are there. And so they're really there. The UN is really there just to protect them, basically, is what he's saying. He's like, we can't do anything for you. But we're here to protect these um, people that are not from your country. Which is not good. Because Paul is, like, asking him to take refugees to the UN refugee camp. And he's like, our camps are full. We have no more room. We've already got so many refugees that we're having to protect. We can't fit more. So Paul is, like, super mad. He goes in the kitchen, and he <laughs> staff is listening to the radio again. And Paul's like, super mad at them. And he's, like, yelling at them, asking them for help, and just telling them that they basically they just need to do their jobs and act like everything's normal. And I'm just like, at this point, there's no acting normal. <laughs> Your country is in basically a war, and you're just asking your employees to act normal. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, maybe it's just a way to help them get their minds off of it, but I still feel like that's, that would be really hard to do. Like, if there's literally people getting killed up the street in acts of genocide, as they call it. There's, it's, I'm not going to be able to work under those conditions. Like, I'm going to be worried about all that, you know? 
It's it's gonna be. It would be. I would not be good in that situation. <laughs> I would not. I'd be freaking out. He calls the hotel people, and was it Belgium? Yeah. And he's concerned. He's like, well, I want to try to keep the hotel, you know, like normal and everything. And and he asks the owner to, what was it, um, fax over the thing that says that he is the manager and everything, you know, like it's running, like, you know, has to run everything now so he can get his yeah. freaking people to work. Yep. And so he, he like has a meeting with everyone and he tells them that. And he is like, I don't want to have to use this. I want to give you the choice. If you want to work here, fine. Do it. Work, please. But if you don't want to work, then just go. And I think that the employees kind of respect him in that sense because he's aware of what's going on and he knows that they're all scared, but he's telling them he's scared too and that he's going to try and do everything he can to keep them safe while they're working. So. So the cameraman, um, oh, he goes up and he's um, talking to not the cameraman guy, not Jack. But, um, the other guy, I don't remember his name, um, but he's the other, he's like the reporter person, like putting together the the footage and asking the questions to everybody. So he's like the reporter and he's like editing footage when Paul comes in to fix his air conditioning, I think. Yeah. But Jack comes in with new footage from out in the devastation. And he puts it on and shows his boss, but Paul also sees it because he's in the room. And it's just kind of crazy what's going on. Like, you just see tons of people getting killed and tons of bodies all over the ground. And it's that's really hard to watch. Uh, but Paul says that he is happy that the world is going to see... And he um, wants them to tell the world how, like, what's going on and everything. The part about that people just like, oh, okay, this is on the news, and then just keep, keep, keep eating dinner. Yeah. Jack Was does that... say that. He just says it just like a little bit after this, because he's downstairs oh, okay. eating yeah, dinner. Gonna... Yeah. And he does yeah. say that, because Paul's like, well, I'm happy that people are actually going to see this. You know, maybe we might get some help. And then Jack's like, well, they might see it. They're like, oh my god, that's horrible. And then just keep eating dinner. Yeah, because they think they can't do anything. Exactly. And I mean, he's not wrong. That really is the mentality of the rest of the world. Like, we see something bad happen and we're like, oh my god. But nothing. We don't do anything about it. Like, we're just like, oh my god, and then go about our business. <laughs> Sad to say that, but yes. That's literally how it is, and then I just think it's so dumb. Yes, I'm calling myself dumb. Call me dumb, too, and it's okay. <laughs> um, but so, then there's, like, something going on out at the gates. And they hear that there's trouble out there, and that there's Hutu people coming to the hotel. Like, trying to get into the hotel and stuff. So, the UN goes out there and kind of just stops them. Like, they pull out their guns, but um, Colonel Oliver's like, don't shoot, don't shoot. Just kind of trying to fend them off as um, a bunch of uh, Tutsi people run into the hotel as the Hutus are, like, chasing them in there. And then there's these guys, these Hutu guys on the back of this truck... And one of them's holding a UN helmet, and he throws it at the UN guys, and we see there's blood on it. So I think um, that they killed a UN member. At least a few of them. Yeah. And then Pat, I think, comes back, and she's telling about how she went and checked her brother's house, or how she checked Tatiana's brother's house, but it was empty. 
And then they asked about the girls, and she said that she found the girls. There was this woman down the street who had taken them in and was taking care of them. So she felt comfortable leaving the girls with her. And then she tells about how when she got to the orphanage, the Hutu people were already there killing all the children that were left in the orphanage. And um, then the little what's about the little girl saying she's like apologizing for being what she is. Yeah. I was like, Are you kidding me? And then um I think it's like the French military or something. Somebody comes as a military that comes. And everybody thinks they're leaving, everybody thinks they get to go home or get to not go home, because they are home. Um, but like the Europeans and visitors to the country they're like, oh, cool, yay, we get to go home, we get to get out of this nightmare. And then all the Rwandan people are like, yay, we get saved from this nightmare, let's get out of here. But the um, Colonel Oliver goes over and is talking to the commander of the army that has come. And you can see he's like super, super mad and he like storms inside and Paul follows him and he goes to get a drink. And then he tells Paul what's going on that they were only taking the Europeans. They're only taking the people that are not native to Rwanda. So it's pretty much saying we're going to get our own people out and pretty much uh, you're on your own. Bye bye. Yeah. Like basically you don't get anything. It's pretty much a big middle finger to them. Yeah. And you can see how mad Colonel Oliver is, but there's nothing that he can do. He has orders. And if he doesn't follow those orders, then I don't know how all that works, but it's not good for him either. Like, he's basically abandoned there too, pretty much. I'm pretty sure if he doesn't follow the orders. Um, but then Paul tells his wife everything that's going on and stuff. Uh, they are only allotted four men to protect the gates at the hotel. And then we get to see all the evacuations happening. Like, they're evacuating everyone from, like, Europe and America. And literally everyone that's not Rwandan gets evacuated. And this is kind of heartbreaking too because you see people that are there like there's this one woman that it showed a couple of times that she was helping with the kids but she has to leave they're making her leave because she's not Rwandan and she's just like breaking down trying to take some of these kids with her because she wants to rescue them but they're not letting her because they're Rwandans then the buses are like leaving and stuff and Um, we see a bunch of nuns and clergymen coming with a bunch of kids and other refugees and the soldiers are like, you you can't put any of them on the buses. You can only, people not from Rwanda can go on the buses. Like there's still all of these people there. Some of them are like bloody and hurt and they're still not letting them on the buses either. Like they're dead set only foreigners on the buses. Only foreigners are getting out. Then we see this man with a camera and he's like taking pictures of everything. And I'm just like, how can you be so insensitive to this situation right now? He's like very clearly a tourist. He's not one of the um, reporter. He's not Jack or the reporter guy who I forget his name all the time. But he's just like sitting there. He's just a bit tourist and he's just taking pictures. I'm just like, wow. And then um, we see a dog in a woman's lap. And I think that's kind of a directorial choice to put the dog there because he's um, trying to say that they were basically considering dogs more important than the Rwandan people. Because that little dog gets to go, but the Rwandan people don't get evacuated. I don't remember the dog. Yeah, it was next to the... The man's taking pictures on his camera and then the dog is sitting in uh, the woman's lap that's sitting next to him. It's like a very brief moment. Huh. How did I miss a dog? 
It is shown. <laughs> I don't think I noticed it the first time either. But then I was um, doing some research on this and uh, on the movie and stuff. And somebody had mentioned something about the dog. And then I was looking for it. So that's why I saw it. Because I was looking for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't notice the dog. But okay. That night, that night, so Paul and his wife are, like, laying in bed and everything, and she's just like, I want you to take the kids and leave. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, 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 it's not gonna happen. I think it's because, you know, she's Tootsie and he's Hutu, so I think it might be the kind of thing where, um... Their papers, I guess, or the fact that he, they may not have their papers saying whether they're Hutu or Tutsi yet. So the fact that he's Hutu, he can get them out safe if she's not with them. Yeah. I think that's what she's trying to get at. That's exactly what she's trying to get at. And he's like, no, it's not going to happen. I'm not leaving you. Yeah. Then they wake up to um, a soldier with his gun against Paul's face saying that everyone needs to leave the hotel. Um... And he's like, give me ten minutes so I can get dressed and take a shower and stuff. And he tells his wife and kids to go up to the roof. Um, and so he's like, the soldier has given him the time and stuff. And he's like trying to call somebody to do something. And so he calls the president. He ends up on the phone with the president of Sabine. Which is the hotel people. Yeah. And he ends up calling someone else. He ends up calling um, General Bizimunga. I think that's I think that's who he calls. Um, but the general of the Hutu army so that the Hutu general can tell all his soldiers to stop what they're doing. Um, but so he, Paul tells the soldiers that are there he's like um these are all my guests and so the soldier is like well then I want to see your guest list and the guest list is like two weeks old because they've been in this crisis for a while now and so it's got a bunch of European names on it and the soldier's like this is not correct and so he's like I want the names or I'm gonna kill everyone in this hotel because he's, he says he's there looking for Tutsi rebels. Um, because he's got information that there's Tutsi rebels in the hotel. Um, but he gets a radio call and he has been ordered to leave the hotel. And Paul gets his family off the roof. And then the president of Sabine says that the French and Belgian are not going to come and get them. Like, they're on their own. Um, so, what Paul does is he tells everyone to, like, everybody in the hotel that they need to call anybody that they know and, like, make them feel guilty about the situation to help get them out of the country. So, it's like this big, huge phone tree and stuff. And then he's, like, making, he's trying to make the hotel seem legitimate, like they're actually running a hotel. So, he... Starts printing off bills for everyone. And he's like, if you can't pay it, that's fine. Just pay what you can. Because he's trying to make it, like, if the soldiers come, make it seem like these people are actually paying to stay there so that we don't kill them. So. This is where you hear the radio thing about saying that's not a genocide. Yeah. During this whole, I've even, like, looked it up a little bit, too. But, like, during this whole entire thing. Other people that are not Rwandan will not say that this is genocide going on. They will not say it. Okay. All they're saying is acts of genocide. And then the guy's like, so you're going to say acts of genocide just so you can be clear of calling this a genocide? And I'm just like, well, he's... It's like, we're not calling it that, but it's, we're saying it's close. Yeah. Like, it is. Let's just call yeah, what it just, is. Say what it is and stop being stupid. <laughs> it's like, you know the saying, if it looks like a duck, it quacks yeah. like a duck. Um, so the general of the Hutu army goes to the hotel. And he's talking to Paul. 
because he had asked, Paul had asked him for help, and now Paul, he's like, well, you gotta help me. This is basically an eye for an eye, pretty much, is what he's saying. And then he sees Greg Gregoire over there acting like an ass, and he's like, Paul tells him that he is one of the employees, and so the general gets mad and goes over there and dumps a bucket of ice on him. And yells at him to get back to work and stuff. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> but so, Paul has to go get more supplies. So he makes Gregoire go with him. Because Gregoire is Hutu. So they have to go into the Hutu base to get supplies. Because that guy at the beginning that they got supplies from is a Hutu. And he's like one of the leaders of one of the bands of the civilian Hutu army, I guess, because it's not really the military, but it's people out there killing. And so he, of course, takes Gregoire because Gregoire is Hutu and he thinks it's safe to take him. But we see a whole bunch of prisoners in that area and they have been stripped down to their underwear and made to stand out in the elements. The supplier guy, what's his name? Uh, George. Yeah. Uh, he's saying that he wants the Tutsi rebels that are in um, the hotel. He wants all the traitors from the hotel. And Paul's like, basically, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Then they're, they leave after they've gotten their supplies and stuff. And the road gets super bumpy, so Paul thinks that Gregoire has driven off of the road. So they get out, because it's like super foggy, so they can't see at all. They think that he's going to drive into the river. Um, but so then he gets out of the van, and there's bodies everywhere. And they were just like, as far as you can see, bodies. Yeah, that, that one was a bit tough, I will admit that. But so they get back to the hotel and Paul is changing because he, he fell on these people because he didn't know it was on the road. He So he fell because he stepped on one of them trying to get out of the van. So he's like covered in blood. And he's like changing back at the hotel. And he breaks down. Like he just can't take it anymore. He's been trying to be strong for everyone that's in the hotel. He's been trying to be strong for his family and his friends that are in the hotel. But... He's got a moment alone now, and he just loses it. Yeah. I mean, Which you is... can only be strong for so long. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a basic human thing. Like, you're going to break eventually. Yeah, you can only take so much before it all just wears you down. Then we get this cool moment of everybody just kind of acting as normal as can be in a situation like this but we've got kids dancing um people outside just like there's some kids playing people outside talking and we see just i really liked the imagery of the kids doing the dancing but then paul takes his wife they're like having dinner in the hotel and so paul takes his wife up to the roof as kind of like a getaway from everything because they haven't really had time alone in probably months at this point. Then he's telling her that they need to have a plan for when the soldiers come because he knows it's inevitable because they don't have anybody to protect them. So he says that he wants um, her, to, if they come, to take the kids up to their roof and to jump off the roof because that would be an easier and better death than the Hutu army coming and killing them with machetes. So then... The next day, or at some point, it's later on. We don't. I don't really know what the timeline of all this is. It kind of skips around. Yeah. But the UN uh, Colonel Oliver has come back, and he has exit visas for people. But not for everyone. There's only, I think it's like maybe ten families that get an exit visa. Actually, it might be more, because they have two truckloads full of people, so. Yeah, and Paul's family is one of them. Yep. Went to Belgium? Yep, they're going to go to Belgium, I believe. 
But so they're all getting on the truck, and Paul's, like, starting to get on the truck, but he, like, looks back at all the people that are left, and I guess he feels guilty, because he goes, he whispers in his friend's ear and says he's not going. Yeah, just to take care of him. Yeah. Take care of the fam. Yep, take care of my family. Because I think that's, like, his neighbor slash best friend. Um, because he was at in, like, the beginning doing, like, a dinner thing with them or something. When they were kind of acting normal before anything happened. Paul doesn't get on the truck. And then we see Gregoire steal a van. And he drives to the Hutu people and gives them information about how the UN is taking people out of the country. I'm like, what an asshole! Yeah. We hear on the radio about it, so now everybody knows. And at the same point, the UN is driving the trucks through this big group of Hutu people that are standing on the side of the road. And so they ambush the trucks. And they, like, start trying to pull people from the trucks and stuff. And Paul calls General Bizimungo, Bizimungu and asks for help. And he's able to get soldiers over there, the Hutu soldiers over there, to stop the Hutu people from killing and attacking these Tutsi. They're not, I mean, there might be some of the rebels and traitors on that truck, but we don't know for sure but they're trying to kill all these innocent people like they're literally about to kill tatiana at this point and i'm like i don't get what this dude is like you tell these people that they're leaving what does that benefit you Nothing. i think he's trying to get like a pardon from the hutu people because he's in the hotel with a bunch of tootsies so he's like trying to provide information to them to no he's just an that asshole that's not... what i think yeah, but I think that was, like, his motivation. I don't give um, a shit. You sacrificing all those people's lives for yours? What yeah. an asshole. Yeah, he is. That's the definition of an asshole right here, people. It definitely is. Yeah. But there's, like, this whole big, like, scene there. Like, a whole bunch of stuff happens. And so they get back to the hotel. And... Paul's family has a hit out on them now. Like, if anybody sees them, their family, his family is dead. Because we hear it on the radio. He says, um, the Hutu propaganda guy says, Rusisa, Rusisa Bagina family or something like that. And he's basically telling them to kill him. His wife is pissed at him when they get back to the hotel because she, he left them to go by themselves. And he's, like, apologizing and stuff. They start taking water from the pool because the water has been shut off. And the rockets. Yeah. The general's mad at him because there's no supplies, so he says he's taking all the protection away. And then that's when the rocket... But so then there's the attack on the hotel and everything. And luckily nobody was, like, severely hurt because it was just a storeroom that they shot the rocket into. So, luckily, nothing terrible happened. It was just cuts and bruises and then, of course, fear. But nobody was killed. But the UN Colonel Oliver comes back and says that they can get everybody moved behind the Tutsi rebel lines to where they will be safe. But it's going to take them two days. And Paul's like, we don't have that long. We're going to die if you leave us here for two more days. So Paul heads over to the Diplomat Hotel. That's the other hotel. He's like heading over to that hotel. And on the way, he sees the Red Cross van that Pat um, drives around. is like flipped over and kind of crushed on the side. Like it's been attacked pretty much. But there's like people running all over the place. There's soldiers shooting at the people running. And then... Paul goes in and gets some stuff for the general from the hotel. He gets because he can get into the safe, so he gets some whiskey, I guess, and some jewelry and stuff. And then he tries to give Paul tries to give the general money. He's like, "What am I gonna do with this right now?" So he just like throws the money on the ground. 
And then this is where Paul tells the general that he is wanted as a war criminal. And the general's like, why? I'm the one protecting all these Tutsi people. Why am I wanted as a war crimin criminal? And Paul's like, well, because you have all these soldiers and Hutu people running around killing. He's like, but I'm stopping them. And he's, and Paul's like, you have five stars on your chest. They don't know that. And I'm like, well, he's not wrong. No, he's not. <laughs> because they just look for the head person. They don't look f like they're not always looking for the little guys. They're looking for the head person that they think calls the shots. And as much good as General Busy Munga has done, he's still like, it doesn't matter because this is happening under his watch. His soldiers are doing this under his watch. Oh, and it goes to the, the hotel is being just like raided. Yeah. They've got all the people out um, of the hotel and like they're going through it looking for stuff. And Gregoire is with them because Gregoire is trying to get Paul arrested and killed. Because he's an asshole. Yeah. But um, the soldiers show up and stop the Hutu people from killing anybody. And he's like protecting them. So Paul goes up to the roof and thinks his family has jumped because he sees some people laying on the ground under the bushes. But then the woman turns her head up and kind of just shushes them. Like, <laughs> sh sh they're pretending to be dead because they think that's the safest thing that's happening. Like, it looks like they jumped off the roof, so. I mean, that's a good strategy. It is. That's what I thought when I saw it. Because the first time I saw it, I thought that really was his family. Because we had gotten the scene earlier where he's telling them to jump off the roof. And then we see people laying on the ground. There's a woman and three kids. And you have no idea who it is because she has um, this thing on her head so you can't see anything other than their clothes and then the kids but then so they're like looking all over paul's like looking all over the place and then finally he finds his family and his good friends slash neighbors in the bathtub in his room and his wife is threatening him with the um shower head <laughs> he's like what are you gonna do with that <laughs> yeah i thought that was funny like, they did put a little bit of comedic relief in here, which is good because it's such hard material to watch. So that little bit of comedic relief they have occasionally is good. And I thought this was a good little moment there. I was like, you need to have that or else like, it kind of reminds me of like Les Mis. Like it's such a depressing musical, but you have to have the comic relief of the innkeepers. So that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, um, I don't know if that actually happened that way, but... Um, it's funny still. Yeah, I say it's still funny. But then the UN is evacuating the hotel, and so they're all in these big, huge trucks, and they're driving towards the Tutsi um, base. And we see all these people going the other way. And to me, that says, you guys are going the wrong way, because I feel like those are more refugees that have been turned away, because there's no more room behind the lines of the Tutsi rebels. Like, they they can't take care of anybody else. That's why all these other people are leaving. But they get over there, and they're, like, across the line, and Tutsi soldiers are shooting everywhere because there's Hutu people coming. And so it's kind of dangerous crossing that line because there's so much going on, and you can't control where bullets are going very well. Like, you can kind of control it, but there's only so much you can do. Um, but so they get over there, and then um, Colonel Oliver tells Paul that they're going to get evacuated to Tanzania. Well, they need to get on the bus, like, yep. now. <laughs> yep. Um, but they go look at the lost kid board because they think there's a possibility that the girls are there. Their um, Tatiana and Paul's nieces are there because they think that... I think... Earlier, they had been provided information that that's what, where they had been taken. Um, but so they're, like, asking everybody about the girls and stuff. And they're looking at the lost kid board and all that. But they don't see them. They can't find them. So they get on the bus. And they're ready to go. But Pat, the Red Cross woman, 
sees them on the bus and she like goes and stops the bus and gets them off the bus and she takes them over to this group of kids and then they see the two girls and so we think that you know they're just gonna take the two girls but they end up taking probably a good 15 20 kids with them on the bus there's always room yeah i mean they're kids they can sit in people's laps oh yeah you know you can fit a lot of kids in a place it's true. But then that's the end of it. Um, that's the end of the movie. But we do get a little bit of information. Um, there were 1,268 people sheltered at the hotel. Tatiana's brother and wife were never found. So they're presumed dead. The general was arrested for war crimes. And then um, there was almost a million people killed in this genocide. Yeah. Which is really crazy to think about. But that's it. That's the end of the movie. So the music is by a few people in this. um, Afro-Celt Sound System, which is a group, I believe. It might be just one person, but I think it's a group. Uh, Rupert Gregson Williams and Andrea Guerrera. I didn't get any information on them because it was three people. So that was a lot of information to get. But uh, I did really like the music that was in this. The Million Voices song is an amazing song. And just kind of crazy because where they put it, they really get feelings from you because it's kids singing that song. So, And if you get little kids singing, it always brings tears. It's true. I know this for a fact. Not not for me, but... For most people, Kat. Yeah, I say for most people, but I don't cry very often. I know you don't. But I did feel it. You felt something. I felt something. I just don't (laughs) cry, so... You're not a cryer. I'm not. No, you're not Paula. It's like you and Paula are the big, like, complete opposites of each other when it comes to emotions. Paula feels everything, and you're just like, eh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I get it. I just don't really feel it. <laughs> oh, that was a funny time. <laughs> this movie and that song are... I do feel them. I just don't cry. Uh, but I did like the music in this a lot. I felt like it was placed really well. And I also felt like it helped bring out some emotions. Like, this is already terrible things that are happening and then the music just plays on that just like pulls on your feelings the feels but yeah that's the um music so the comparison uh like we said before this is based on true events there is actually a lot of controversy about these events there's a lot of people that are saying paul is lying about what happened and then there's other people that are saying he's telling the truth so My view on it is, if this really did happen, he's a hero. But if it didn't happen, this is terrible. Like, him lying about this. I don't know, because I've never actually... I wasn't there, and I've never actually talked to the guy, so I don't know what happened. The genocide is real. But the events, like, at the hotel and stuff is what comes into play and what's controversial. If you want more information on what happened in this entire situation and, like, the Rwandan genocide, then you can look it up and see for yourself. Because I'm not going to do it. No. I'm not going to be that person. Um, so, trivia. I do have a few things. Go ahead. Um, Paul actually had four kids. But during they were, like, getting ready to film, and the other kid that they had cast was just acting terrible, and they didn't have time to cast another one. <laughs> so they're just like, oh, we're just going to cut him out of the story. It's like, screw it. He's got three kids. <laughs> yeah. So they just, had, they just had to cut him out because he was just a terrible child, I guess. He was, like, acting horrible on set. In the commentary for this, Terry George literally just talks to Paul over the movie and like asks him questions about stuff and um one of the things 
that shot where we see Paul's son, Roger, like, covered in blood, that actually didn't happen. Like, he did go run and hide somewhere, but he wasn't covered in blood. I think that was just kind of, like, a dramatic effect on Terry's part. The part where Paul is, um, like, frantically looking for his wife and kids because he thinks he's jumped off the roof, he said that, um, in the commentary, he said that he wasn't worried about that. Like, he wasn't even thinking about that at that point in time because there was just so much else going on that he didn't have time to do that. So that entire scene of him, like, running around looking for his family was um, just for dramatic effect in the movie. I was like, well, Paul did help with the director. He did help. He, like, they went to Rwanda and everything, you know, talked about everything that was there, you know. He really did help him write this. Yeah. Um, of course, the general um, was sentenced. Yep. He was sentenced to 30 years in 2011. So he's on year, what, eight now? Eight, yeah. So 22 more to go. Yeah. Um, Paul really did talk with John, um, Don Cheadle, which is really nice. I like when actors yeah. get to do that, get to meet the people that um, they, um, you know, are portraying and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got much, I don't got much about that. Like, you covered a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so where it has been on the list before, in 2010, it was number 115. In 2012, it was number 146. In 2014, it was number 164. 2016 number 185 2018 it was not on the list and then as of today when we were recording it is number 218 so it is dropping and I don't think it's dropping because it's one of those movies that people don't like I think it's dropping because of the content like what it's about and also because there's so many good movies coming out right now like I just went and looked through the um, stuff and there's like probably 20 movies from the past five years oh, on this list <laughs> wow so there's a lot of good movies coming out right now so it's just bumping these older ones down and off the list so that's what that is so previously number 189 2010 list the night of the hunter from 1955 the 2012 list howl's moving castle from 2004 nice the 2014 list, The Grapes of Wrath from 1940. The 2016 list, Network from 1976, which we just had. The 2018 list, The Grand Budapest Hotel from 2014, which we had a couple weeks ago. And then as of today when we are recording, How to Train Your Dragon from 2010, which is coming up for us. Yeah. So, favorite line... Um, I can go first. I have... Alright, uh, family is all that matters. We must shame them into helping us. I thank God every day for the time that we've had. And this is my favorite one. Why are people so cruel? Oh, that's a good one. That's my favorite. Um, soon all of this will be over. You should spit in my face. That's when uh, Colonel Oliver is like super pissed off that the military is not going to evacuate the Rwandans. But when you say goodbye, say it as though you're reaching through the phone and holding their hand. You do not honestly believe that you can kill them all. I cannot leave these people to die. I would pay you to shoot my family. Um, that one I wrote down because that's what a lot of people were doing. They were, like, begging. Like, a lot of the Tutsi people that were getting killed were begging to be shot. Because if they killed you with machetes, they would do it very, very slowly. They, like, would come and cut off one body part and then leave you and then come back later and then cut off another one and then just very slowly kill you with a machete. So there was a lot of people just begging to be shot instead because it was faster. So I was just like, holy crap. Like, I just can't even believe. Like, it's hard to even know that that 
was something that people wanted because they already knew that they were going to die. So they were just trying to make it faster and make it easier instead of being killed by a machete. But I think either why are people so cruel or where'd that other one go? I cannot leave these people to die. Those are my two favorites. Oh, cat, you gotta pick one. Uh, I'm letting you pick. Because you like this movie a bit better than I do. Uh, I'm gonna go with why are people so cruel. It's a good line. Good line. I was like, that just stood out to me. I was like, whoa. That's what I'm thinking, too. Yeah. Alright, so what's your rating? I'm giving this a six. I am. Okay. Some good acting. Story. Again, like I said earlier, it was honestly just the direction for me. The directing for me. Yeah. That's, that's per- that was my biggest hang up on this. Was the directing. And the direction it was going. That That's about uh, it for me. So it's a six. Okay. Um, mine is an eight. Because this is one of those movies that actually makes me feel something. You know, like most movies I just kind of watch them for like entertainment factor. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I most know. Movies, I don't even care. I know. But this one I'm actually, it just like, this movie makes me mad. You feel something. Yeah. So I'm giving it an eight. Because I did, the acting is really great. It is slow to start off, but we do have to get, like, we have to get information on stuff. Like, we can't just be thrown into this chaos and massacre that's going on. We actually have to get information and stuff. Because it's not a documentary. They can't just throw you into the chaos. They have to build it up a little bit. And you have to learn who Paul is and, like, what's going on and stuff. Um, So it is a little bit slow at the beginning just because... Of the way they kind of start it, of him just kind of going and getting supplies for the hotel. You're just like, what's going on? But the acting is great in this. I really liked the music. The cinematography is good, even though a lot of it is shots that are really hard to see. But, I mean, yeah, that's all I got. So, our next film is In the Name of the Father from 1993, and it's actually written by Terry George, which is the director of this film. It's not directed by him, but it is written by him. So, we'll see. Um. (laughs) In my opinion, that's what I say. We'll see. (laughs) But yeah, that will be out next week. And um, our event for this month... Uh, is our Halloween event, and it will be out on Halloween. This will include Beetlejuice and Hereditary from me. And for me, Young Frankenstein and A Nightmare on Elm Street. Yep. It's like, it's gonna be so nice talking about those, not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make sure you check that out, because that'll be, um, those four episodes are gonna be good. Uh, We are offering premium. If you would like to become a premium member, you can sign up on our website or on the Podbean app. Um, On the website, you just go to the main page, uh, catandjesstalkthebest.podbean.com, and you uh, just scroll down a little bit, and it's over there. You can see it. It says subscribe, I think. Um, But if you pay a dollar a month, you will get uncut episodes, early release episodes, and a special monthly episode. And if you pay $5 a month, you will get to pick a movie of your choice to join us every 50 movies. So that's four movies at this point. So our special episode for this month is Batman and Robin, which is a movie that I really didn't ever want to watch again. But (laughs) we talked about it anyways. And that will be out on October 30th. Because we have the Halloween event coming out on the 31st. So I didn't want to bombard you with five episodes in a day. Um, And just a premium, all that does is it really helps us um, be able to pay for the website. Because it's not free. (laughs) Which sucks. No, it's not. It's okay. okay. But yeah, that just pays for the website for us. Um, So if you could do that, that would be great. And then 
if you can't do that, then we're leaving ratings and reviews is another way to help us out. It gets us more listeners. And um, it also tells us what we could do better and what you like. So there is that. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, you can interact with us there or you can email us. Um, I already said what our website is. That's where you can find all kinds of information, like the list coming up, um, events and stuff, our special monthly episodes. Like You can find like everything on the website. Our music is by Audio Binger, and you can find him on Facebook, YouTube, and his website, audiobinger.net. I think that's all we've got for this one. So thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate it. And we will catch you next week with In the Name of the Father. Bye. Bye. Bye.